You are listening to the Hydat Podcast. In each episode, we share our knowledge with you on topics related to hydraulics, automation, and control. From the basics to the current trends, stay tuned. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Uh, my name is Jared Downsmith. I'm a technical training officer here at HIDAC. I'm here today with my, Mr. Michael Seed, uh, one of HIDAC's electrical engineers. Uh, and we're going to learn a bit more about an electrical standard uh, that's making waves in the industry. How are you, Michael? Do you mind introducing yourself to the listeners? Hi, Jared. Um, yeah, my name is Michael Seed. Um, feel free to call me Mike. Uh, like you said, I'm one of the electrical engineers here at HIDAC. Uh, I work in HIDAC's automation and control engineering ACE team. Um, my role here is to design and project manage uh, the electrical control systems here at HIDAC. Um, I started here as a grad. HIDAC trained me up pretty well, and I'm succeeding to this day. Uh, one of my responsibilities um, is to research and find and then implement uh, new electrical standards into our design and build processes. Yeah, and one of those uh, last few years has been ASNZS 61439. That's, I think that's what we're here to talk about today. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so today we're going to cover AS61439. So in a few words, are you able to uh, briefly describe what it is to start off? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so ASNZS61439, uh, it's a bit of a mouthful. You could just say the numbers, I guess, from here, 61439. <laughs> um, it's a self-assessed design verification standard, and the title is... AS NZS 61439 low voltage switch gear and control gear assemblies. Yeah, basically it's like I said it's a design standard um, for designing low voltage switch gear and control gear assemblies. So electric pretty much any electrical enclosure in the low voltage range that contains a uh, switch gear or control gear uh, falls under this thing. Okay. So so do you know why this new standard has been implemented? Has there been any incidents that have led to this or What's really caused these standards to be put into place? I don't know if there's been any incidents or anything. It's uh, it's replacing an old standard that has served Australia well for a long time. Um, but Australia in recent decades has been doing a big push to become more aligned with how they do things in Europe and international compatibility. And uh, 61439 um, is almost a word-for-word a uh, copy of a European standard that's currently in practice called IEC 61439. So the real push behind the standard is to take our existing standards, which are already pretty well aligned with most engineering best practices, but to make them uh, have a little bit of more European flavor to them so that electrical goods and services can go back and forth uh, a little more streamlined between the continents. Okay. And um, yeah, it, it, and it's replacing ASNZS 3439, um, it officially replaced it and has been lost since about 2021. Um, and the main differences between the old standard and the new is just some terminology changes, uh, a few more requirements around type testing, and um, and it gives a few more options for calculating temperature rise differences. Okay, so good to know. Thank you. So, so when we're talking about control panels, uh, is this standard applicable to all control panels, or is there a certain uh, type of control panel where you'd need this, need to comply with this standard? Um, good question. Um, it's not just control panels. It's um, pretty much all electrical con- okay. uh, assemblies that might have any kind of switching parts to them. Could be a distribution box, could be a control panel uh, of that nature. Um, it's not really backdated and being applied too much to pre-existing panels. There's not really a safety reason to go throughout every electrical panel in the country and replace them all out. You know, it's just expensive for no reason. Because like I said, they all comply to previous standards, which were all safe and best practice and all that. So anybody with a pre-existing panel can relax. Mm-hmm. You're not going to be asked to rip it out of your walls. But it is going to be apl- applied to all panels moving forward and... It's not going to be applicable to all electrical panels, uh, only the ones that fall within the low voltage range, which uh, mm-hmm. for AC is between 50 and 1,000 volts, and for DC is between 120 and 1,500 volts. And also the panels or enclosures must contain switching devices or control devices. So right. breakers, switches, fuses of that nature. So if it's just a terminal box, not really applicable. If it's something okay. really low voltage, not really applicable. If it's really high voltage, um, that has its whole own set of standards. And again, this doesn't ex- extend to that. Okay. 
and there are loopholes to get around every standard you know if you have part of your design that you can't get to comply you can always segregate it in a separate box etc cetera, etc cetera. so and another thing it's a design verification standard so it really only applies to the first time you build something if you repeat a job or if you mass produce a product you only need to verify the very first one then you can reuse that certificate for all the others you know unless you're changing your design it's considered the same thing okay yeah so if, so for, so for those uh, control planet panels that are going to need to comply with this standard so the new ones going forward if it is requiring requiring that extra work and that design verification is that going to make control panels more expensive in short yes um but not extremely so um the main differences are it's going to be for the designers it's going to be a bit of extra paperwork and it's going to be a couple of extra tests that you have to perform and a few more design considerations um you're not drastically changing everything you know, we're not reinventing the wheel here, but uh, we're now having to provide certificates for that wheel, you know. So it's the main increase is going to be in man hours. Um, every job is going to have a couple extra man hours for, you know, the bureaucracy behind it. And the extra evidence requirements sometimes might result in having to buy more expensive parts because one of the quickest shortcuts to getting a panel compliant is making sure everything you put in it is pre-compliant sticking to parts and materials that come certified to their own standards, have data sheets, et cetera, et cetera, so that you don't have to certify them. Saves you time, saves you money, but sometimes that means a more expensive part and that could increase uh, costs as well. So say say you had a electrical panel that uh, was found to be non-compliant. Are there any legal ramifications? What might happen if you're found to have a non-compliant uh, panel? At the moment, there isn't any single government authority that's going around inspecting these panels for this exact standard yet. So if you install a panel that doesn't come with a certificate of compliance, um, no one's gonna come kick in your door, ask to see your paperwork and then arrest you. You know, you're yeah. pretty safe in that regard. Where this comes into play is that at the moment, any electrician or technician does have the legal right to flat out refuse to install any new electrical assembly or enclosure uh, that isn't compliant. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be an important thing for project managers to keep in mind because, you know, you're going to have to pay those guys for showing up to work, but they can flat out refuse to work because you don't have your paperwork in order. That can run up your costs until you, you get your documents. Also, the, the one thing I think nobody ever wants to see happen is if anything goes drastically wrong, even if it's not entirely your fault, when you go to court and they ask, hey, was everything compliant, every standard, fingers are always going to get pointed at whoever has the least paperwork to back them up. And this, mm -hmm. is, this is a strong tool to have in your pocket for that. Um, as my manager likes to tell me, always have everything in order in case you have to talk to the man in the curly wig. We all hope we never have to, but if you do, yeah. it's nice to be the one who shows up with all of your, your ducks in a row. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Um, so, so are you seeing any effects on our industry here in Australia because of this? What, what are you sort of seeing from these changes? I have a bit. Um, so HIDAC, we partner and work with a lot of the other companies where it's a very collaborative sort of industry here in Australia. And I, it's one of the things I love working about this dynamic environment. But I have seen a divide between businesses that know about this standard and are implementing it and being compliant and businesses that aren't quite up to speed for various reasons yet. And you can you can kind of see that rift sort of building. Um, it's making a lot of people kind of decide whether they want to invest the resources into getting up to speed with this or if they just want to put their blinders on, pretend they don't see it and keep going business as usual. And that's not necessarily the best route to take with it because Pretty much every government job is asking to see the certificate. The mining industry has always been very standard heavy, and mm -hmm. we're seeing more and more customers from there are saying, hey, we need this document uh, before we can accept your panels. And so it it has been, it's being asked for. Um, I don't want to see anybody out there suffer business-wise because they don't have this going for them. Even if they're a competitor today, they might be a business partner tomorrow or even a customer. You know, it, it all kind of goes yeah. full circle like that around here. So what's good for the industry is good for everybody. So I would, mm -hmm. and what's bad for a couple of people in the industry is bad for everybody. So I would, I would like to see everyone get up to speed on this. And as much as it, a lot of the process is uh, internal IP, um, intellectual property, and as much as it's uh, everyone's own individual responsibility to figure out how to get compliant on their own, we got a lot of help from partners in the industry with learning the standard, figuring out how it works, and 
cracking it to get compliant. Hynex always here to help. I can't do the whole job for somebody, but I got a lot of advice when I was putting this process together and I'm willing to advise others if they come to us, especially mm -hmm. people we've worked with, friends of the business. Yeah, Hydex here. Uh, we know about the standard. We put a lot of effort into it and yeah, we're, we're here to help if you need it. Excellent. So when it comes to who should know about this standard? Do you think it's something that everyone in the industry should sort of get up to speed with and understand? Or is it sort of more towards just the manufacturers, the people that are actually making the panels? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think it's something everyone should be aware of. Maybe not mm -hmm. everyone needs okay. to know every exact detail of it. Um, that knowledge responsibility should be on the people designing and making the panels or enclosures. But I think everyone who works in a field that's related to engineering or has to work with electrical anyway should be aware of the standards so they know to ask for it or they know yeah. looking at something, hey, that doesn't look quite right. Because the standard, so HIDAC, we mostly do control systems on our electrical side. It's not all we do, but that's mainly our bread and butter. Um, but this standard does apply to other avenues of the electrical industry. Um, it has specific sections on control gear distribution boards, um, specific requirements for construction sites, public networks, distribution boards and the like, and, and many more sort of sections. So if there's electricity going, going through your job, uh, maybe take a look yeah. at your boxes and make sure they have their paperwork in order. So sort of off that um, are all of the electric, electrical panels here at HIDAC compliant with the standard? Yes. Uh, it took a while to get there and took a lot of effort, but we, yeah, I'm confident to say at the moment all of HIDAC's electrical assemblies are compliant. Like I said, I had a lot of help uh, getting us there, but we've gotten there. Uh, we've developed a nice process for verifying all of our designs. One of the tricks we did is that we standardized our process as tightly as we could. If you look at our website, we have a standard range of panels. They all come pre-compliant. We've pre-verified all of those ones. Our custom jobs, we try and keep as similar to that as we can just to kind of streamline our process. But yeah, we've we've got it down pretty well and yeah, I'm pretty proud of what we can do. Excellent. So there will be a, a part two uh, on this topic, but are there any final message that, messages that you want to say or put out there before we sort of conclude this session? Yes, uh, I just want to touch back on that um, technically 61439 is a self-assessed verification. So it is on you as the designer and the panel builder to assess yourself. And when you issue a certificate of compliance at the end of the job, it's you who issues it. There's not a government authority who checks it. You have to comply your own evidence. You have to do your own tests and you have to put your name on that legal document swearing that it's compliant. So it's a promise from supplier to customer uh, at the end of the day. And um, again, as much as Developing our process of compliance is internal. Again, we got help to get there from others in the industry. Mm. We're more than happy to answer questions or give some advice to anybody else who's still finding their way. Australia is a nation of mates and we're all here to help. Awesome. Thank you for joining me, Michael. Uh, this, I think this has been a, uh, a great introduction to the standard. Uh, I hope all of, of our listeners now have a better idea, I'm sure they do, of what it is, uh, what it means. Again, there will be a part two of this series where we'll go a bit more in depth on it, but from all of us here at HIDAC, uh, goodbye for now. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the HIDAC podcast. For a more in-depth learning on the subject you've just listened to, enroll in our technical training at HIDAC Australia. For more information, visit our website at hidac.com.au. HIDAC, global presence, local competence.